reject. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you for your patience. You know, everyone loves computers, right? Uh, so again, my name is Jenna Zygen, and I'll be talking to you about what would happen if your brain were literally JavaScript. Uh, I'm going to keep the suspense a little bit while I introduce myself a little bit more. So I'm an engineering manager at DigitalOcean, um, and so I'm, I'm a, the manager of the front end team. And you might know me as Zygenvector on Twitter. The Zygon puns don't really go as far here, but that's cool. Um, and if you want to follow along on your own computers or send these slides to someone else, you can find them at jenna.is slash rejectjs. All right, so I'll admit the title of my talk is a little uh, clickbaity, maybe. Uh, so our adventure today is really going to be comparing bits of human cognition to bits of JavaScript. The thing is, humans know a lot more about JavaScript than we know about human cognition. That's because humans made JavaScript. But really, all the stuff we know about human cognition, about how the mind works, we really know from just poking at the human mind with experiments. Therefore, we only really have theories about how the human mind works. We know really nothing for absolute certain. There's also a lot of different subcategories within cognitive science, and trying to cover all of these things and compare them all to JavaScript in 30 minutes would be a little bonkers. Uh, but also, a lot of this is irrelevant, right? JavaScript doesn't perceive, it doesn't make judgments on its own, and it's not conscious, and let's hope JavaScript never becomes conscious, right? But there were a few of these that I saw that had potential to compare to JavaScript. So I chose three of them, and those are what we'll be covering today. So first, and perhaps most obviously, uh, we'll talk about human language as it compares to programming languages. Secondly, we'll talk about human concepts and categories of versus JavaScript's prototypes and primitives. And thirdly, human attention versus the JavaScript event loop. So. The most obvious comparison is comparing JavaScript to human language. So there's a pretty obvious difference in here, right? Which is that JavaScript is a programming language, it's synthetic, and human languages are mostly natural languages. So being that JavaScript is a programming language and that is, it is synthetic, it has a lot more regulation than natural languages. So for JavaScript, we have TC39, this standards body who uh, pass specs, hold discussions on certain things. I don't really know what else they do, to be honest. Um, but they help JavaScript uh, stay in line and keep evolving. So because of that, JavaScript also evolves a lot faster than human languages. Human languages evolve, but it's, it's pretty slowly. It happens over hundreds of years. And the evolution is mainly, you know, we bring in words from other languages, and slang gets like, kind of more officially in the language, you know, that moment when on fleek is going to be in the dictionary. Um, so yeah, so this happens, though, like, slower than um, how JavaScript, JavaScript evolves. Like, you might have felt like it take, took a really long time to pass the ES6 slash 2015 spec, but that was pretty short uh, as compared to natural languages. Despite all of this change, though, human languages are a lot harder to learn than programming languages. So, you know, to become proficient at a human language takes years and years and years, and it gets harder and harder as you age. Uh, after the certain point when you're really little, called the critical period, when you're kind of like meant to be learning new languages. While with programming languages, I'm willing to bet that the vast majority of us learned how to program or are learning how to program as adults. So another big difference that I see between programming languages and natural languages that I think is really cool is that programming languages create and manipulate the programming environment rather than just describe it. So it's language itself that is making these changes to the environment. It's mutating state. It's making new objects. But we, don't really, we can't really do this with natural languages. I can't say, we're not, we're not like wizards from Harry Potter. I can't say Akio chocolate bar when they'll fly up to me on stage and then I could eat it right here in front of you. But 
I have heard a lot of people talk about how they feel like when they're programming, it feels like they're doing magic. That is because of the ability for language to uh, manipulate change and have an effect on the environment. But it's not all a pile of differences. There are some similarities between programming languages and natural languages because they are both languages. So both classes of language have both syntax and semantics. So syntax is, you know, what is, like, what's the right way to put words together? It's kind of what you're studying when you're studying grammar. So they both have that. Semantics is the study of meaning, so either on a word level or a sentence level. So, you know, lines of code have meaning, you could say that. But there are even still more differences. So natural languages have their own morphology and phonology, while programming languages don't, because these are related to the natural evolution of languages. So these languages, again, are evolving naturally versus the evolution of programming languages, which is more regulated and synthetic. So morphology is the study of the building blocks of words. Those prefixes and suffixes, the Lego-like kernels of word meaning that uh, may or may not come from other languages, such as uh, Latin or Greek. And phonology is the study of the way that we pronounce words and the way that they sound. And um, because a lot of the words that are, that are used in programming languages come from English, if you're going to pronounce a word, if you're going to pronounce a line of code out loud, it's going to sound like you're speaking English. Uh, so programming languages, especially JavaScript, don't have their own phonology. Another similarity is that uh, both programming languages and natural languages have pragmatics, which is, you know, what is socially acceptable or idiomatic within the language. These violations aren't necessarily ungrammatical, per se, but they're just not quite right. And in programming languages, you, you see this in style guides. So, you know, you've got your ESLint and JSHint and stuff, so things that come up that aren't necessarily syntax errors, but you might get warned of by these uh, tools. So, so something that really affects semantics and pragmatics is context. So human language is highly context sensitive, uh, while programming languages are less so. So while the ECMAScript spec defines a context-free grammar for its parser, it immediately goes on to say that this grammar is not sufficiently powerful to explain if something is valid ECMAScript. However, human language really depends on context and is, cannot at all be described by a context-free grammar. Uh, and human language relies on context so much because human language is filled with ambiguity, uh, either semantic or syntactic. But we don't really ever notice this. And that's because our brains are so good at using context to what's called resolve the ambiguities, to find the right meaning, the intended meaning for the words or the syntax which was used. So an example of a syntactically ambiguous sentence is, I saw the unicorn with the binoculars. So this can have two interpretations. It can either be that I was using a pair of binoculars to see a unicorn, or that I see a unicorn who owns her own pair of binoculars. So well, I mean, I think this is pretty cool that uh, human language can do this. It would be really dangerous for JavaScript to have syntactic or any type of ambiguity, because you're really counting on, on the consistency and the repeatability, the deterministicity of a line of code, especially if you're going to like, call different functions in certain areas. You kind of want it to have the same effect whenever you call it, right? So, yeah, not so great. So it's context that allows human language to be rich. Uh, it allows us to do cool things with language. It allows us to make puns, which I think is the favorite type of wordplay in the JavaScript community. Uh, you also get meta-meaning from context. So the way that you say something affects its meaning. For example, sarcasm. We know that everybody loves sarcasm, right? So, uh, human language is messy, and it's great most of the time, and JavaScript is not that messy, and it's also great most of the time. So one thing that we really depend on context for is what's called reference. So in human languages, these, this comes up as pronouns. It's like, okay, well, yeah, it seems like variables could kind of be a pronoun analog in programming languages, because variables you... Um, 
define a thing, and then you say what it refers to, and then you keep using that thing that you defined. While with pronouns, they refer to something like otherwise mentioned within a context. And in, in human languages, there's two types of, of reference. Uh, one is called anaphora, and the other is called cataphora. So in anaphora, the reference, the thing that you're referring to, comes up before the pronouns. So you see Jenna and talk before she and it. In cataphora, the pronouns occur before the things that they're referring to. So you have she and there before Jenna and Berlin. While this is fine for humans, uh, JavaScript is not super cool with this, right? Uh, so much so that there's variable hoisting that will theoretically fix the cataphora should it occur. Uh, so it's not in the, in the final parse product or whatever. Um, I saw another form of reference in, in JavaScript that was not really dis like distinguished in human language, uh, which was JavaScript's this. So, for JavaScript, the reference is kind of implicit. You never really officially define what this is. It's just part of the way that JavaScript works, and it's based on the context. Uh, and JavaScript always has this down, even if us as humans reading a program might not have it completely down. You might not know what this is all the time if you're reading code. Um, and then if all else fails, JavaScript will just all else fails. JavaScript will just say it's in the it refers to the global scope. Imagine if someone used a pronoun and you didn't know what it was and you just figured it referred to the whole world. That would be kind of weird. Um, uh, the thing is, we don't need this default because we are capable of following up and asking what things mean. So um, we're much better at error handling. It's not that humans don't make syntax errors. Like, there's dangling pronouns everywhere. But um, it's... You know, we can say, oh, like, who did you mean by she? And then they'll be like, oh, I meant Jenna, so you didn't catch that. Um, while if this happens, JavaScript would just uh, <laughs> throw a syntax error, and it wouldn't be that great. Um, so moving on, um, because we as humans use language to represent things, and JavaScript is a language, it makes sense that both human language and JavaScript deal in this field of concepts and categories. Uh, this is also known as knowledge representation, and it is essential for humans' abilities to uh, parse with and deal with the world and interact with things. Uh, if we were to have a, a unique way of dealing with every single object in the world, we would fall over kind of like JavaScript does uh, when it encounters a syntax error. Um, so we put things into buckets so we know how to deal with things generally. And this is um, it's how we effectively and efficiently deal with the world. So this is, this is called cognitive economy. So um, an example of what we might use concepts and categories for is identifying that this Yorkie puppy is a dog and not a cat. Uh, you know, this, it could possibly be a cat, right? It has some cat-like features, pointy ears, it's furry, it's kind of the size of a cat, four legs, and if it never makes a sound, you don't know that it barks. But we know it's a dog automatically. There's no problem with that. So for humans, a lot of this concepts and category stuff is about object recognition. So how do we recognize and then deal with objects? But again, JavaScript doesn't perceive because it's a programming language. Um, so but like, I was like, there's got to be something in here. Like, let me just keep looking through my notes. So as I was looking through my cognitive science notes, some words kind of stood out at me. Uh, so I was looking at the, the categorization theories, and there's classical and prototype theory. And then it was like, that looks familiar uh, as compared to inheritance architectures. Um, this might actually be a coincidence, these, the words themselves, but what is not a coincidence is that the overall theories are actually similar. This the classical theory of categorization is very similar to uh, object inheritance in JavaScript and some other programming languages. Uh, and this is because one of the authors, one of the, the theorists for this first uh, categorization theory uh, was, before he was working on this cognitive science stuff, he was uh, thinking about how to organized information within computer programs, he realized that it was most economical for computers to use well-ordered hierarchies. And then he was like, huh, yeah, I wonder if this applies to humans too. Let's run some experiments. 
So he and his uh, partner in science came up with this semantic network uh, about which to test subjects. Uh, so in this, you see categories are organized in a hierarchical structure, and there's feature inheritance. So to test this, they presented subjects with yes or no questions, and then measured their reaction time to try and model this chart in time. So they asked us questions about the pure hierarchy, such as, is a canary a bird, and is a canary an animal? They also asked questions about uh, feature inheritance. So is a canary yellow, and does a canary breathe? They found that, true to the chart, it took longer to answer questions that involved traversing this hierarchy more. So it took longer to answer, does a canary breathe, versus is a canary yellow, because uh, yellow is a property on canary, and breathing is a property on animal. So for the most part, the subjects had reaction times that pretty much modeled this chart. And uh, I'm pretty sure that if we ran JavaScript through the experiment, it would perform like a human, because method dispatch kind of looks like this. But there's, it starts to break down a little bit in humans. Um, so there's things called typicality effects. So for example, sharks aren't really typical fish. So you know, sometimes this gets a little fishy. Pun callback. Uh, <laughs> So um, it might take longer for you to verify that a shark is a fish uh, than it would be to verify that a shark is an animal. This doesn't really follow that hierarchy, right? So the theorists were like, all right, well, we've got to reevaluate this. And they came up with some new theories. And these are more about similarity uh, than about hierarchy. Um, but it's OK, because we're talking about humans and not about programming languages. And you know, this, I couldn't really find many similarities in here between this and, and JavaScript, uh, except that it seems like prototype theory is kind of more like classical inheritance, and exemplar theory is kind of more like prototypal inheritance. But that's cool. Um, whatever. I did learn, and I, I did get out of this, that maybe object orientation is, in fact, a good way to structure your programs. But I'm going to move on before I get rotten tomatoes thrown at me. Okay. So another uh, subset of study within, basic, within concepts and categories is this idea of basic level categories. So this is a natural level of categorization. It's what we tend to use in conversation. It's this just right level of specificity that is usually the pragmatic choice. So if we go back to our trusty hierarchy chart, uh, bird and fish would be the basic level categories in here, while animal is the superordinate category, and canary and ostrich would be the subordinate categories. So I was like, huh, yeah, I kind of see this coming up in JavaScript, too. Um, my human brain kind of thinks that like function and number, these are kind of basic level categories in, in uh, JavaScript. So I went back to the trusty ECMAScript spec, and lo and behold, I found a list of things that I saw, huh, yeah, this could be JavaScript's basic level categories. Um, and I ran them through, and it's was like, OK, so if they're going to be basic level categories, um, well, first, object is totally the superordinate category. It's the, the top of the chart. So if they're going to be basic level categories, they're going to have object uh, like close to, as their prototype. So I did this, and then I did that and felt really silly, because of course this is what happened. Um, but I was like, there's something missing here, right? Like I thought function, like my human brain was thinking that functions were basic level, and what about arrays, and even date and promise? Um, so I read the spec a little more and found them in a list that also included all the aforementioned things, uh, the previous list. And this list was well-known intrinsic objects. So these are things that are explicitly referenced by algorithms of this specification. Uh, and I did more science on these. Uh, and <laughs> some of these make sense. Uh, and I wouldn't argue, um, to, like, but other ones so like array is in here, but also float32 array. And my human brain is like, well, if array's in there, float32 array is not a basic level. But um, 
JavaScript is a programming language. It doesn't have to think like a human. Uh, so if it wants to have a basic level category system, then a human would. Um, that's cool. Uh, so thus far, we've been focusing on language and representation. But what happens if we think of the JavaScript runtime as a mind and compare from that angle? So um, there are a bunch of uh, metaphors that cognitive scientists will use to explain attention. So one of them is attention as a filter. So you know, your attentional system is going to put everything through like a sieve, and only the important stuff is going to fall out, and that's what you're going to pay attention to. Another metaphor is attention as a spotlight. So the important stuff is highlighted, and everything else falls to the wayside. So you only pay attention to the stuff that is under a spotlight. There's another metaphor, which is attention as glue, which is a little into the weeds of cognitive science. Uh, so there's some theorists that think that when we perceive, we perceive these like object features, and then it's attention that binds them together into a, a discrete object. Uh, and then lastly, there is another metaphor of attention as control. Uh, so this control is blocking out unwanted distractions and automatic processes. So an example of how attention works as executive control is this thing called the Stroop task, which you might have seen in those email chains of your. Uh, so with this, you're supposed to say the color that the word is written in uh, and not read the word itself. But this is really hard because reading has become an automatic process for us uh, as we get older. So it's really hard to not read the word and to say the color instead. So um, none of these really apply to JavaScript, because they're about, about perception, and JavaScript, again, doesn't perceive, because it's a programming language. And JavaScript also doesn't have automatic processes like we have, like for example, reading. So I was like, well, there's got to be something here. And then I remember this kind of back-channel metaphor, uh, which is attention as threads. Right? So we kind of think about threads or at least I do, as multitasking. Um, but yeah, so we can extrapolate and use this metaphor of attention as threads. But humans are really bad at multitasking. Um, there's a bunch of studies that have shown this. Uh, one of them is an inattentional blindness study. So um, I'm just remembering this particular video that they showed me in my cognitive science class. Uh, I'm not going to spoil it in case you want to go and watch it on YouTube. But um, the premise is that they tell you to uh, you know, count the number. There's two teams passing a ball back and forth, and you're supposed to count the number of times that uh, only one team catches the ball. I think it's the white team. Um, and if you actually focus on the task, um, I guess you can watch the video if you want. But the thing is, it proves that you're really bad at paying attention to things or noticing things you're not actually paying attention to. So you can't really multitask. Um, there's another uh, study which is called uh, the dichotic listening task in which your pr uh, subjects were presented with two speech streams, one in one ear and one in the other. And they're supposed to only pay attention to one and maybe do a task such as saying, saying back the words that were spoken in one ear so that to make sure that you're actually paying attention to only that. Um, but, and then they were asked questions about the other speech stream in the other ear and they they're remembered very, very little. Um, whether it was like gibberish, they didn't even notice that. There's no semantic information that goes through. My favorite was one of the studies presented. Uh, they spoke Czech in an American accent to American subjects, and they didn't even realize that it wasn't English. They're just like, oh yeah, everything was good. I just don't remember what, what the actual content was. So. You we really only can focus on one thing. Uh, but there's some light from some experiments about exactly what's going on with our inability to multitask. So they found that if you're presented with two simultaneous activities, but uh, in different modalities, so for example, uh, linguistic versus visual, so words and pictures, you have more of a chance of remembering um, both things or being able to attend to both things. So uh, if you're supposed to shadow or repeat back 
words, subjects were able to uh, recall information presented in pictures uh, better than they were able to remember information presented in printed words, and then they were still really bad at remembering any information spoken to them while doing a uh, shadowing task. So this brings to um, brings up this idea of task-specific resources, or multiple capacity theory. That it's really not that we can't multitask, it's that we can't do too many we, have a, we can't do too many tasks within, within one like, modality silo, so you can't do too many things at once that involve words. You can't do too many things that involve visual tasks. So it's just all about balancing all that if you really want to multitask. JavaScript just can't. It just it can't multitask at all, right? Because it's, it's single-threaded. So if we're actually talking about the JavaScript runtime and thinking about the event loop as attention, JavaScript will only do one thing for you at once. Um, but JavaScript is asynchronous. It's really just calling out to other APIs. Uh, and if we're just talking about JavaScript, those DOM, browser, C, APIs, even web workers don't really count. So JavaScript only has one capacity, being JavaScript. All right. So I had a really, uh, I really enjoyed going through and comparing JavaScript to human cognition. I've never ever thought I would read the ECMAScript spec, but I did, or at least parts of it. And um, I learned some new things about human cognition too, even though it was my major in university. Uh, <laughs> so um, I hope that you learned some things too, and that you can use it to better your JavaScript skills. I, um, Thanks for listening. I will tweet the slides. Feel free to tweet questions at me too or sing my praises or whatever. All right. Thanks again. Bye. Reject. <laughs>